Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast hosted by two men who would gladly abandon their families at the chance to visit a Mission Impossible set. Wow. Wouldn't wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, this is Drew Taylor, joined by Charles Head. Hello. We have a very special episode today. Yes. We're talking to Brad Bird. Yes, uh, and we want to we want to correct what we said. I think it was last week. Oh yeah, we had said he was a three time nominee, right? Right. But it turns out he's actually a five time Oscar nominee. Yes, because we forgot about the screenplay nominations for The Incredibles and Ratatouille, which is very rare for an animated movie to get a screenplay yes. nomination. He did it twice. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty awesome. Um. Yeah, and if you're just tuning in, we want to encourage you to listen to all the other shows. I mean, a lot of really fun episodes. Yeah. Great interviews with Christopher McCory, editor Eddie Hamilton, who edited the last two missions, Lauren Balfe, who scored, did the music for Fallout. We've done breakdowns of all the movies. We've done... Yeah, I was going to say, ours, the ones that we are just by ourselves, pretty good. Yeah. We've done Unmade Missions. It's a yeah. good episode. We talk about all the unmade Mission Impossible sequels, like from David Fincher and Joe Carnahan and Oliver Stone. And then we have a whole episode dedicated to the screenplay, to the Oliver Stone Mission yeah. Impossible 2 that didn't get made. And that's a fun episode. Yeah. That's a deep dive. That's, into uh, that's eye-opening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's pretty nuts. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of uh, programming notes for this episode, though. Oh, yes. This is the first interview that we've had some technical difficulties. Yeah. The There was a lawnmower uh, outside next to where we were recording. So especially in part one of this interview... There are there are some sounds in the background that are, are not great, and we apologize for that in advance. Also, we had a problem with our recording equipment where in the middle of part one, it cuts out. So he'll be telling a story, and it will just kind of cut out in the middle of him uh, finishing the story. And then it'll just he'll he'll pick it right back up. So we we didn't lose anything. We noticed it, it the the recording stopped in the middle of of his story, and we were able to just uh, keep record. We started recording again, and it worked out fine. But just to warn you, unfortunately, this interview has that issue. Parts two and three are, are better sound quality wise because the lawn mowing stopped. Yeah, <laughs> or wasn't as uh, as constant. Right. <laughs> so. We apologize for that, um, but uh, yeah, it is what it is, and 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 Brad is amazing in the interview. Yeah, so. you're not gonna care if there is yeah. a lawnmower going off. Uh, do we have anything else we have to talk about? We there is a midnight show of Mission Impossible Fallout on March 30th at That's the right. Vista in Los Angeles, and I know we have some uh, a good amount of listeners in California. Should Maybe we, in Los Angeles. Should we do so a little meetup? We people should come and and come see it. I've got yeah. my ticket. Drew does not have his ticket yet. I'm, I, I urge all of you listeners to shame him into getting his ticket. <laughs> I should get it because I think an early bird special is cheaper. Yes. But maybe if enough people talk to us on Twitter and want to do it, we'll do some kind of meetup beforehand. Because it'll, yeah. be at, it'll be at midnight, so maybe we'll go to a coffee shop or, or something around there. Yeah, we'll tweet out the link, too. For, it's the Secret Movie Club, I think is what it's called. They do 35 millimeter prints. Uh, midnight movies every weekend, so we'll 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 get that link out there for people to check it out because it would be cool to go see that. And there'll be a poster too. We always bemoan yes. the lack of merchandise. Yes, so. but they they do an exclusive poster at every screening, so that'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, but there's some more things that we'll talk about after we finish part one. So we'll talk to you after this. Yeah. Enjoy Brad Bird part one. All right. Welcome back to Light the Fuse, and we are so thrilled to have our very special guest. Uh, two-time Oscar winner, current Oscar nominee, perhaps three-time Oscar winner by the time this comes out. Oh, I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are joined by uh, Mr. Brad Bird. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, we love Ghost Protocol. Obviously, the name of the show is Light the Fuse. There you go. So we, we saw uh, we started that. You started yeah. that. We we uh, not maybe... like they've ever done it again. But... <laughs> <laughs> The moment we became obsessed with this franchise was that moment, I think. Oh, yeah. We saw it in IMAX at uh, the Lincoln Square AMC oh, in, cool. in New yeah, York. We, had, and we, we saw it the same day you did your talk at uh, Lincoln Center. Yeah, we went, oh. to, we went to that talk. I actually went with him for that. Yeah, so <laughs> could you talk about that opening sequence? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the cool things about working on that is I was. it kind of ties into how I got involved in it. Um, after Incredibles, Tom Cruise asked to talk with me and, and invited me over to his place. And I just went over there and we just talked about movies for like uh, two or three hours. 
and it's his knowledge was extensive. I mean, it was a, a lot of times you talk to people and their knowledge of film goes back maybe 10 or 15 years. And, you know, t we were talking about stuff from the silent era and, and he could talk about Harold Lloyd and know what he was talking about. And I love that. And, and uh, he just said that he really liked um, Incredibles and, an Iron Giant, and um, that if I ever wanted to do a live action film, you know, he wanted to work with me. And I said, absolutely, I'd love to make one with you. You know, I mean, he has an amazing body of work that uh, I think people kind of forget how many really good films he's been in, you know, and been really good in. <clears throat> and so fast forward, I'm uh, finished with Ratatouille. I'm trying to get this project called 1906 off the ground. And just the project is this massive and complicated thing and I look up and I, I haven't cracked it yet and two years have gone by and I'm starting to go I can't have on my gravestone he worked on 1906 <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so I thought I gotta I gotta do a movie I want to do a live action movie I've, I've you know been wanting to do one for a long time and I've got to just make it happen so I looked around and at what, you know, I'd been offered things over the years and, and couldn't do them because I was involved in the animated films. And so I kind of looked around at what was available and JJ had uh, been talking to me too previous to that and uh, talked about certain films that I wasn't able to do. And um, I went down to Bad Robot with Michael Giacchino, who did Lost with J.J. and, and uh, Alias, you know. And uh, J.J. ran into us there, and uh, I just, he said, what are, you, what, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm actually kind of looking for stuff. And that night, when I came back from L.A., I got this little text from J.J. that just said, Mission? Question mark. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's cool. And the reason I thought it was cool was that of all the franchises, which is kind of what, if you like to work on a big scale, the, the films that are gassed up and ready to go are franchise films. Those are the ones the studio has confidence in. They're, they're not gonna give you some oddball project that's, that's really you, you know, right. different from everything they've done. They're gonna do the ones that they have confidence in. So of, of all the franchises that, that I was looking at, that was the one that was most intriguing to me because at that point anyway, it was the only franchise that adapted to different director's styles. They weren't trying to impose a house style on a director. The Brian De Palma one was very different from the John Woo one, which would never be mistaken as the JJ one, which would is different from mine. And the fact that they could that they wanted each director to have a different style, you know, given that, you know, it's going to be a spy movie that's going to have Tom Cruise and a, and a team of IMF agents. But other than that, you could kind of make your movie, you know what I mean? And I like that. I like that, that it embraced the different styles of the filmmakers, whereas other franchises didn't. They told you, this is our stunt team and this is our... Da da da, and you just are kind of in there to direct traffic, you know. Right. Um, so, it it happened sort of that way. And one of the things that was cool is they said, "Have you? Do you have anything that you really want to see in a spy movie?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I have a bunch of things, you know." And they said, "Now's your opportunity, basically." And of the six or seven things that I suggested, uh, I got to do all but one of them. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do was pay tribute to the, the TV series titles. And one of the things that was cool about the titles, besides the fact that the fuse is burning all the time, is that they showed you bits of the episode you were about to see. But because they were scrambled out of order, you even though uh, you're seeing stuff from the episode that you haven't seen yet, it's not a spoiler because it's out of context and it just becomes intriguing. You're, you're just like, oh, this is in there. That's in there. I want to see this. So I thought, is there a way to do that that's updated? And, and uh, I thought of following the fuse 
and having the fuse dimensionally take you through different scenes. And originally it was going to be more than what we wound up with. When we first started shooting, all of that stuff was going to be in IMAX. And what the plan was is once you finish shooting a scene on a set, you have everybody do part of that scene, but with a completely different camera move that rushes through that set. And, and it was all going to be shot in IMAX. And we only ended up shooting like three of them because the IMAX cameras are huge and you have to get a running start with them in order to, to move them quickly through a space. And it just became too hard. Now, if I was smart, I would have shot it in this division or something that's, that's not cumbersome. And I would have been more casual and just done it on every set and then later figured out how to wind the fuse through there. But we shot like three or four of them in IMAX. And then it became more about uh, getting the concept to the title house. Because we it, the film was, the schedule was too crazy to to effectively do that for the, for everything. But the idea was good. And, and so when we got to the end of it, I just said to the title guys that, um, the idea is that we the fuse is going to lead us through every scene in the film, and instead of being flat, it's gonna we're gonna follow the fuse as it snakes through the scenes of the movie, and uh, so they took that idea and ran with it, and uh, it it was fun. All of the previous Mission Impossible's there's there's a thing that kicks in that that you can't show more than one or two titles, which is usually the company name and the title of the film. Um, without triggering uh, a union requirement to show all the major uh, department leads. And so they said, I said, well, why hasn't, hasn't it been done before? This is like one of the greatest theme songs in the history of movies or television, period. Uh, and they said, well, we didn't want to trigger, we didn't want to go through a whole title sequence. And I thought, why the hell not? You know, <laughs> I mean, you've got this amazing theme song and let it roll, you know? So Giacchino was excited about that because he loves the theme song. And we just said, yeah, let's trigger everybody's titles and do a big title sequence. And then it became, well, we're gonna do that. Can we set it up, you know? Can we set it up and have them packing, you know, explosives in the opening? And then that's the thing that they're lighting the fuse for and you end, you end the sequence with an explosion. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it's an amazing title sequence. Uh, what did you want to ask about Kyle Cooper? Well, so yeah, so you brought, did you bring back Kyle Cooper from the first movie? He did, did the title sequence for the first movie? I didn't know that. Oh, um, really? No, I just, we just <laughs> picked him because uh, he was great. Maybe somebody suggested him knowing that. Yeah. But I just looked, we looked at three or four places and they had the coolest reel, so... We just said, these guys. Yeah, they did a great job on it. Yeah. It seems like there was a concerted effort, sort of, to honor the first movie in some way. At least Paul Hirsch, the editor, came back. Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if that wasn't in, <laughs> Yeah, in, no, I mean, I knew, or... I knew that Paul did it, and I thought he did a great job on it. But I was also honoring the editing of Star Wars oh. and Empire Strikes <laughs> Back right. and Ferris Bueller's Day Off and, and you know... Uh, Ray and I mean he has uh, an unbelievable uh, you know resume. Yeah, yeah. So he's a an editor that I whose work I'd always admired and his range I admired the fact that he could do a comedy and then a suspense film and then a great the sci-fi fantasies of Star Wars and uh, um, he was a delight to work with. But there did seem to be more callbacks, at least at some point. I mean we've seen a script where Vanessa Redgrave's character is actually in the movie. Um, and I'm assuming that's why you brought the the henchman guy back. And we thought we were going to get her, so we were setting that up. Yeah, well, I was going to say, how close did that... Um... Well, uh, <laughs> our friends at Paramount did not want to pay Vanessa Redgrave. Okay. Uh, what Vanessa Redgrave rightly deserves. Right. And uh, so... After setting, teeing up Vanessa Redgrave, we couldn't get Vanessa <laughs> Redgrave. And I was bummed, and Tom was bummed, and I felt like in the first Mission Impossible movie, the scenes between Vanessa Redgrave's character and Tom's character were some of the best scenes in the movie, and they had this weird uh, 
flirty by play yeah. Yeah. that was um, flirty and sexy without you believing that they're necessarily going to wind up in bed. Yeah. Like they're having, they're, they're uh, attractive to each other. Yes. And, and, but in a way that's really sophisticated. And uh, I think she's a magnificent actress. And I was like uh, licking my chops to be able to work with her just because uh, I admire her work so much. And I was really bummed when they didn't, do it. Um, yet I think our solution that we came up with was worked all right. Yeah, the fog. The fog. Yeah. Um, Which was a Chris McQuarrie name. <laughs> well, yeah. I was going to ask you sort of what what was your relationship with... Uh, I'm sorry for all the uh, mowing going on. Because <laughs> it seems like the script went through a pretty radical change. I mean, yeah. the script that you signed on to was not the movie you made, necessarily. No. Um, we heard talks <laughs> about, like, a big uh, a snow st- fight and the, the, a oh, secondary man. team taking over towards the end and all well, this stuff. Well, uh, I don't know about the secondary t- dairy team part. I don't. Um, I just know that there was a, a giant sequence that opened the movie that, that Tom was not in. And uh, it was going to have the Josh Holloway character and... Uh, it was a big sequence. It was on the snow and it had snowmobiles and this really crazy notion of um, somebody is trying to basically kill themselves so that they don't give up the information. So they poison themselves. And one of the characters like reaches into the heart and keeps the heart going to get the information out of him and saying, I can keep you as alive as long as uh, it takes to get the information and I'm not going to let you die. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, it was intense. (laughs) And I, I kind of liked it. You know, I thought this is really crazy and it could be very intense and it was on the ice and the ice was going to crack and all this stuff. Uh, And uh, I also thought it was ballsy because the audience would go in expecting Tom right away. And, it's suddenly this other bunch of people that you don't even know and are not, don't have any history with. And then that sequence goes south. I mean, and, and you then show Tom, I thought it was a, actually a good way to set up Ethan Hunt, you know, uh, is to not have him just because that's what everybody expects now. (laughs) So we wound up, with a different sequence that had to do with Tom's team getting him out, just like they do in the finished version, except it was all of them basically going into the area where you talk to prisoners and then blowing that up and actually getting, you know, blowing something up in order for Tom to escape. And I had a gag that I suggested that Benji was going to come in there. And when he talked, it would sound strange. And he actually had an artificial tongue that was made out of plastic explosives. And so he pulled it out of his mouth and smashed it up against the, the plastic or the bulletproof glass or whatever. And it blew a hole in it and they got him out. So we, that's what we were prepared to go there and shoot. And we go there to shoot, and I'm sitting here trying to stage this. Paramount had delayed us scouting anything until Tom's deal was made. And that pinched our time, so we had no time to scout. And we're there, and I'm trying desperately to to figure out how we've got this prison that's a defunct prison um, outside of Prague, about an hour outside of Prague. But it looks cool. I mean, it looks decrepit and weird and... And it was an active prison like 20 years ago. So I'm there. I'm I'm trying to set up where's this stuff going to happen. We find a room and we say, okay, here's where the da-da-da is. Okay, where's where's uh, the prisoner? Where's the guard? And, and nothing worked. In other words, nothing worked in a way, nothing physically worked in a way that would allow us to shoot what was in the script. And then we kept having to invent stuff. Well, how about if we put another guard there? And then that became problematic for the next shot. Well, if the other guard is here, then he can see blah, 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 blah. And it's obvious that... And pretty soon there were so many fixes on fixes to make this work that I just said, forget it. We're not doing this. 
and then and then on the spot, I mean, uh, not that moment, but over the next night or so, we had the idea of um, controlling the doors. And uh, Jim Bissell had to kind of quickly come up with a device that, that looked convincing and bulky enough to fit in that prison um, that controlled the doors. And once I had that, I, I wrote in some of this stuff with the Bogdan character and, and uh, Tom had this idea of uh, a character that thought that Tom's character was, didn't know that he was English. And, and he <laughs> called him Sergey, you know? And, and that was in Tom's mind. And so we integrated that in, into it. And basically that sequence was kind of improvised out there. There were two guys that we had tested or the uh, uh, Prague casting agent had just shown me a variety of actors that were in the area that were m might work for a part in the film. And I remembered two of them, but I just remembered them like, <clears throat> I didn't remember their names. I just said, there's a guy who, who kind of hangs in the doorway. So find that guy. And then there's another guy who, uh, when she asks him what his name is, he said, my name is Mirai, da 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 da. I am the greatest actor in in all of Prague, or something like that. <laughs> and then he goes, and then he waits a beat and goes, no, 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 it's not true. You know? <laughs> and and I just remembered that, and and I remembered his face and the fact that he had a weird sort of face that could go look menacing at first glance, and then look like oh, he's he's a he's a cupcake, you know. I mean, he's he's a friendly guy, like a good. Uh, uh, a pet or something, you know. He he's like a favorite, you know what I mean. Yeah. He's funny and he, and he's gregarious and and it could go either way, you know. And so uh, I said, find this guy who says he's the greatest actor, whatever it is. I, and I mean, we're we're moving. So they dig these guys up, and I have one guy be the guy, the first guy who wakes up, right? Who wakes up and finds his door open, the kind of guy that yeah, yeah sneaks out. And he was the first guy, and then the other guy played Bogdan. And so the guy who played Bogdan, Mirai, he thought that, you know, he came in for another uh, audition uh, in a sea of auditions three months before and thought, oh, that didn't pay off. And suddenly, you know, somebody calls him on the phone, and uh, like two days later, he's in this giant pl prison sequence with Tom Cruise. And, and, you know, he was just kind of going, what the hell? And then, <laughs> and then, but he was great, right? You know, I loved uh, his performance in the film. And he was so good that, that when Chris McQuarrie came on to straighten out some the stuff in the script, he brought him back later in the film. And so he ended up being a fairly significant part, you know, and it was out of nowhere. When we start, when we came to Prague to start filming the sequence, none of that sequence was in there. That was, uh, you know, I had the idea for the doors and all that stuff. Yeah. It seems like the guy getting stuck in the door is a very Brad Bird gag. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I didn't think of that, but I guess so. <laughs> Well, there was something funny about it. And I also, I like it, and, and this is maybe an old classical movie thing, but I like it when characters are introduced in a way that's distinctive. And I thought it would be cool to to hide Tom's face for a little while. Yeah. Even though everyone knows it's Tom, and everyone knows what Tom looks like, and he's not got, you know, three missing teeth. There's no big surprise and when he turns around. <laughs> but I thought... If we withhold his face and uh, for the close-up part at a pivotal moment, which which is where he decides to go back and get this guy, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that gives his character an introduction. Yeah, you oh, know? that's such a great entrance. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, lo I love that he's also he's not just <coughs> that he's bouncing the rock off the wall it's back to himself; he's bouncing it off two walls and then back to himself. Right, right, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. And of so course, great. Tom loved that right away when I pitched that idea. I yeah. said. Hey, what about if you were throwing, you know, and it took him like two seconds. He, he just points at me and goes, Cooler King. And I go, yeah, yeah, the Cooler King, <laughs> right? You know, Steve McQueen from Great yeah. Escape. So, uh, uh, but we like that he was doing it with a, 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 a rock that has been rounded because he's been doing it so much. Yeah. yeah. You know? Was that an ILM rock? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, you but, obviously but I... I 
I had it. The, an idea I had is that when he hears the music, he puts the rock back into place yeah. in, the, in the wall. You know, yeah. he slides yeah. it into Let's place. Let's set a little spot for it. Yeah. That's where he keeps yeah. his rock. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, you obviously love 60s spy stuff, as it evidenced in Incredibles. But yeah, yeah. Charles loves the original show, too. So we were curious... What you, don't, you don't love the original show, I guess. I, it's, well, I, I, <laughs> I like the original it. show, but it's not it's not my favorite. But what was your relationship with the original oh, show? Oh, I saw it when it was on TV. When okay, was it wasn't kid. like a huge influence or anything. Uh, I really liked it when it was on. Okay. Um, I, I liked the earlier Martin Balsam sort of episodes more than later. Okay. But, yeah. but um, Dan Briggs, the first season, is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> liked it, but... It's kind of better when you're doing something like this than it's better to just remember what you liked about it than it is to go back and look at episodes. <laughs> right. Because if I if I, I started to go back and look at episodes and I thought, well, this is a little more TV-ish and cheesy than I remember. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, not to say that there weren't great episodes, but I didn't hunt for them. Yeah. I very quickly went, no, I'm going to go on what I remember them being like when I was a kid. And, and that's what's going to flavor the film because um, then it's about, you know how when you're a kid and you're at grade school and the halls look enormous and, and you go, oh yeah, man, our school was huge. And then you go back like 10 years later and it seems tiny yeah. and it's like, what? I was living in a Hobbit school, you know, what was going on? <laughs> That's that's your memory is flavor stuff with all this um, uh Great. And sometimes things hold up beautifully. You know, Wizard of Oz is still a great film. Um, uh, even though I've seen it a billion times, it still charms me, you know. But I think that if you're going for uh, the feeling of something, it's better to just rely on the impression that it made rather than the specifics of it. Okay. Charles, you want to talk about Dubai? Should we get into Dubai? Yeah, can we talk about Dubai? Sure. You make <laughs> it a, sound like yeah. it's a big deal. In Dubai stays in Dubai. <laughs> well, yeah. well, well Corey, he's, he's you know joking. He says he's mad at you because there's no way to ever top the Dubai sequence. Just the whole thing, not just the Burj, but the whole, the whole. <laughs> he's got a big smile on his face right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, I just wanted to talk about you know why does that sequence. Why does it work so well, you know? Well, it, it actually starts, um, I think, with the concept of the the two floors over each other. And that was in the original script that Andre and Josh uh, uh, wrote. Both McCory and Ellswood said you were obsessed with going through the floor. Yes. As well, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> when they... When I first heard that idea, and that was in it when I first got involved with it, that was already in the script. I pitched that idea immediately, I said, because then you can see both groups. And, right. and, and the, the cleverness of the concept becomes visual, meaning uh, that they're directly over each other and it's identical rooms and, uh, and an identical scenario happening right. in, in both rooms. And it's almost like two casts of a, a play, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, uh, it, I just thought it was... Uh, you know, Andre Nemec and, and Josh Applebaum had that idea. And it's one of the things that made me want to do the movie. It's probably the thing, if I was to say a point where I just went, that's too fucking cool. I, yeah. I'm in, you know, uh, that idea of two halves of a legitimate uh, transaction are happening, but they're not joined. One half imposters on one floor and one half imposters on the bottom floor. So uh, that got me in right away. And then, um, then it, you know, they had the, I think they were doing something. Brian Burke and JJ were in Dubai for some reason, I think for Star Trek or something. I don't know whether they were promoting yeah. it there or, or something, but they saw the Burj and they said, we should do something with that. So <clears throat> one of the things that was already in place when I uh, got involved, you know, I kept bugging JJ for a script and he kept kind of hiding from me. It was, it was like, <laughs> you know, I, I kept calling him and oh, yeah, I'll get back to you, you know, and then he wouldn't get back to me right away. And then I was at a party that he was at and I started trying to hunt him down at the party. You know, <laughs> where you got me involved in this, when do I get to see a script? And he's like, you know, he's like saying, oh, look over there. And then he's gone. <laughs> 
So I'm hunting JJ at this party. I'm thinking, you know, you, they've gotten me involved in this. I haven't seen a script yet. JJ keeps telling me there is a script, but acting strange when I bring it up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know? And it's like I was hunting him for his tax returns or something. <laughs> and uh, finally he breaks down and he goes, okay, there is a script. There are many scripts. Which one do you want to read? You know, it's not, it's all of them and none of them, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm like, uh, what, what do you mean? You know, you got me in this under, under false pretenses. <laughs> and then I, then I find out that basically that's true of every single Mission Impossible film made to that point, that they all have a collection of ideas, but everything is in chaos and being worked on until the last second. And we were no different. We were exactly the same kind of crazed script troubles that every single other Mission Impossible film has had. And I guess it's that there's something about you're making, you know, an adventure that's uh, a mystery, then you yourself must be confused in that process somehow. I don't know what it is, but that's the way that they're made. Every single one of them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But, but they, all, they all start action sequence first, it seems like. A list of sequences or heist set, thing. Set, set yeah, pieces, yeah. Yeah, which, you know, I mean, Jurassic Park has done that way too. I mean, it's right. it's a way to make a movie. And the truth is, is you kind of want to fall in love with those set pieces because that's what's going to drive you to, to make the movie. You have to fall in, in love with those first because those are the big candy that get you suckered into something that's really complicated and hard. You know, they're kind of the thing that keeps your eyes bright because you go, well, even though this is all screwed up, you know, at least I get to do this sequence, you know, because that's going to just be one of the greatest things ever. And that enthusiasm makes you do the grueling work to make it all connect together and make sense as best you can. So right. was the Dubai sequence, like when you finally got a collection well, of... Well, here's how that happened, is that they knew that they wanted a sequence that involved climbing on the Burj. And I was sitting there going, okay, that's really cool. I like that. I really like the floor switch idea, which didn't need the Burj. It could have been in any building. Yeah, right. right but I really like that device. And I like the, the fact that the, the two uh, scenarios were filled with half imposters on both floors. So uh, I wanted to show how tall the building was. And I was uh, thinking, you know, uh, we aren't gonna be able to put people on that building and it is the tallest in the world. How do we convey that in a shot? You know, in other words, everyone gets that it's tall. But I want them to know it's ridiculously tall, right? And so I was thinking, well, if, if I show it, poke above the clouds. And there's actually a shot that's sort of influenced by that in Incredibles 2, of that original notion. I was going to say that. And that sort of looks like the Burj, the d the Well, it kind of does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, 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 in any case, I wanted to show that it's a cloudy day below this thing and then a the upper half is up where only planes are, which is kind of true of the one in Dubai. The only thing that you see at that level, once you get above a certain height, are planes, you know? Yeah. And, and so I thought, okay, that's a great way to show it. So I mentioned that to Jeffrey Chernoff, one of the producers, and he says, well, you know what it should be? It shouldn't be clouds. It should be a shamal. And I said, what's a shamal? And he said, it's these sandstorms that they get there every once in a while. And so I'm thinking, yeah, okay, that's cool, it's a sandstorm. And I kind of Google sandstorms and some of them come in and it's a, a daytime and within a minute, it's so dark, it looks like it's the middle of the night. I mean, it goes from daytime to the middle of the night inside of a minute. And, wow. and so once I saw that, I went, no, you should have a chase scene in a shamal because I thought uh, one of my favorite things in movies is, of course, the sequence from North by Northwest where it's the middle of a day. It's the most unthreatening looking atmosphere it could possibly be because you can see off into infinity and it's a road and there's, you know, it, there's no people and, and yet this thing comes in out of the blue and, and suddenly the guy's in deep trouble and it's the middle of nowhere. 
you know? And I liked, I thought, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is not having any visibility, even though it's the middle of the day. And I thought that's a great thing for a chase scene to have happen. So I started developing this chase scene in, in the sandstorm. And so once you do that, you have to set up the sandstorm and you have to do it in a way that the audience doesn't feel is totally phony baloney that a sandstorm just happens when the, you know, shit is hitting the fan on, a, on another story level. Yeah. Right. And so the way to, that I figured out we could do that is to have them remark that it's coming earlier on, but it's so far off oh, that it's not a problem. That shot that bends around him. Like that you, yeah. I love that you pan and move and show it. That way you don't cut That's to a it. phony door, by the way, that we had to build is specifically to get that shot. That's a back, so, actually, that, so that the camera could have room to turn and the, see? The, there's a wall there when the shot begins that we have to pull out oh. by the end of the shot to, in order to get the shot. That's so cool. And uh, uh, yeah, I designed that shot because I wanted you to see him seeing the shamal. Yeah. That was to set up that the shamal was coming and do it in a way that nobody's going to think anything of it so that when it hits, nobody's going, well, that's convenient. Yeah. You know, that the storm is happening right at the most uh, intense point of the action scene. Right. But because we set up that it was coming, the audience totally accepts it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, that's uh, one of the cool things about uh, movies and stuff is that the audience will accept crazy information if you serve it up to them the right way. Right. If you don't, and it's really easy to not be, do that, if you don't, they just spit it out and hate you, you know. <laughs> but if you can serve it up and make it look delicious and, you know, fit color wise with everything else on the place <laughs> setting and all right. this, they will gobble it right up and not have a problem. No one ever had a problem with the fact that the sandstorm hits at the most dramatic point that it possibly could. And it's a crazy idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, it feels inevitable. I don't know, somehow, when you watch right. it. I mean, it's, 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 as soon as it happens, you're like, oh, of course this is going to happen right now. <laughs> yeah. It totally right. works. But there's enough other stuff happening that you for, kind of forget yeah, about the yeah, sandstorm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I've asked you this before, but now we really need to dig into this. Why does Hendrix disguise himself as the other guy? And how does he as have the I as Wistrom? As and have the how does he seemingly have a IMF proprietary mask technology? Well, I always thought the masks was kind of a, you know, I mean, you do a great job of really undercutting cool. the masks because they don't ever use any in the in the movie. It never works. They keep yeah. trying. Well, to that was that. one of the ideas that I pitched. They yeah. said, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I want to have the great gadgets, and I want to have them all fail." Right. You right. Know? Yeah. And so that's a running joke in the film that the technology is is a problem, not yeah. uh, a solution. Right. You know, um, which works so well. And the, the they got they went a little crazy with the masks in part two and three, so it was a nice like when we saw Ghost Protocol and the way that they like the masks uh, like the that the design the it's a Sid Mead thing design thing right. the the For mask the, the mask one. creation but yours thing. has two yours has two heads two heads right. yeah and it was they didn't neither they you know they don't work that great look from Paula Patton when she looks was like it didn't didn't work you yeah know, the mask yeah. didn't go through yeah <laughs> well we wanted to make it look like an upgrade from the previous one and then have it fail yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean because yeah. it's like yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the glove technology fails and, yeah. and all that stuff. Well, that's a, another idea I had was the, the gecko gloves. Yeah. And, and it's because um, the geckos have fibers that, that kind of pull out almost like cr uh, quills on a po porcupine, you know. They're tiny, but they kind of come out and allow them to grip on anything. Mm -hmm. And so I read something that uh, was about uh, how... Um, Electricity could be used to, to do that. And it's it's not a thing, but it's close enough to being a thing <laughs> that I thought, well, they might have a prototype. You right. know? And it's a prototype that sometimes works really well yeah, know, and sometimes doesn't work at all. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a funny character thing to have Simon's character always have complete faith in things that he knows 
or have a, you know a, a certain percent chance <laughs> of failure. And it was know? the only it was the only stuff that they could kind of grab to right right because the IMF is shut down. Which right, is just all the they stuff have they is what's on the train. On the right. train, right. yeah, right. Which and yeah, and but the train car is really cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, it's yeah. Just, are the yeah. are the notes that the train makes the first three notes of the theme song? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we were because we, we were watching recently. <laughs> yeah. And it was like this so, where Renner and Cruz are waiting for the train, and then they hear a train sound, and then they go, "That's our train." And when the last time listening was like, "Oh, are those the first couple of notes from the Mission Impossible theme?" Well, Is that might've, why they it know? Might have been. It's not my idea, but <laughs> it, it might have been a sound idea. Yeah, yeah. It might have been a Rydstrom idea. Actually. Right. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, well, the, we another thing that we loved from the beginning are the different motifs and themes for the that the theme goes through for each location. Yeah. Right. Was that always was that another sort of idea that you would come up with initially? Like the theme is going to have a different iteration for each sort of location. Well, Giacchino is really good at that stuff. He kind of gets into um, sort of giddy psychological level of uh, music. And, uh, you know, music is almost like um, the uh, aural uh, equivalent of perfume or something you know how if you smell a perfume it if it's a distinctive smell suddenly you're in whatever place you were first when you smelled that smell or if it was a location that you returned to a lot it just is instant um that's what light motives do um in music and there are infinite number of ways to take uh, an identifying signature of music and and adapt it in, in different ways. And he loved, you know, as I do, the the original theme song. Again, it's it's one of the great ones. It's it it almost seems too good for television. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of great theme songs for television, but it's the kind of thing it everyone knows that and everyone remembers it. So uh, I think he's always looking for ways of of making a, a movie, you know, kind of let those feelings intersect and drift in from another part of the movie. So amazing. Yes, absolutely amazing. We were in the presence of greatness. Yeah. For a very long time. And it was great. And uh, he's so funny too. He's so funny. He's so <laughs> smart. He has a million ideas. Yes. Yeah, just bursting with ideas. Yeah. So it also answers a question that I had from the making of stuff, which I think I sent you a picture of the bottom half of Simon Pegg's face had a prosthetic, Right. Piece on it. He talks about the plastic yes. explosive. And tongue. I think that was a mold that they were going to take and then he was going to, yeah. yeah. So that was so I was cool. always wondering about what that was and now we finally got the answer. And I don't think anyone's ever talked about that version no, of I've the prison. No, I've yeah. never heard that. It's crazy. Yeah. It was cool here to hear him talk about title sequences and how he wanted to. And just to clarify, because we were him talking about doing the full title sequence, because the first movie does do a title sequence. We've always complained about how two and three don't really have a full title sequence. One does have a title sequence that's like the old show, but it doesn't run the whole credits. Right. It The second half of the credits go over the first scene of John Voight in the airplane. Yes. And what Brad Bird did with Ghost Protocol was he did the entire title sequence. So they ran all the titles through an entire... So it's longer. Yeah. And, and it's amazing. It also course. answers... There's also behind-the-scenes footage of some of those sets with the IMAX camera in it. Right. And that he answered that that sequence was supposed to be IMAX as well, but they yeah. couldn't do it for obvious logistical reasons. So, yeah. Yeah. What else did we talk about? Oh, the Vanessa Redgrave coming close to being in the movie. Yeah. I mean, that would have been so cool. Yeah. We've seen a version of this script with her in it, but I don't think either of us knew that it was going to be that close to actually happen. Yeah. That it, it, and you thought maybe... They filmed the intro to that scene with the blonde guy from the first movie. Yeah. When he comes with the mask sewn up, that you thought maybe they filmed that. I think they filmed that first. I think that that's the impression I got that they filmed that first because why else would you have that guy? Right. I mean, and there's some mystery to who he's talking to on the phone. Right. Cruz is talking to somebody you don't know who he's going to go meet with. Yeah. He sees the guy from the first movie, and then price of admission, he puts on the mask. Yes, and then he. And then. He and means, then it's not, it's yeah. not, unfortunately not Vanessa Redgrave. Although that scene is great. It's a great scene. But, oh, it would have been really cool to see Vanessa Redgrave back. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, it will never happen because her character is dead. Yeah. 
<laughs> Although there could be flashbacks. flashbacks. Yeah. yeah. McCory always says you can always bring somebody back yeah. with flashbacks or a twin. Yeah, we could bring... <laughs> but the fog could come back. I mean, he, yes. he's still alive. And I well. didn't realize that character's name was the fog. The only reason I know that is I saw a behind-the-scenes photo in that book that I have. Right. Uh, and then I... So that's who that arms dealer guy, his yeah. name is the fog. Yes. That's another thing that's mentioned in the interview that I didn't know. Yes. That you and Bird knew. Yeah, I mean, that, I, <laughs> as he says, it's a very McCory thing. Yes. Yeah. So. Right. And then the other thing I wanted to just just quickly say, we he mentions Rydstrom. That's Gary Rydstrom, who is the sound guy who did the sound, who's uh, one of the great sound guys of uh, seven-time Oscar winner. Wow. 18-time nominee. He did Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, Titanic, the first Mission Impossible, mm-hmm. and uh, some my, one of my favorites, Punch Drunk Love, which we've talked about on the show before. The sound in Punch Drunk Love is incredible. He did that as well. And they work together at Pixar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's done a couple other Pixar movies, too. Yeah, I think he's like their in-house guy, but Ren yeah. Kleiss, who's another sound guy that we love. You yeah. know, we're a big fan of sound guys <laughs> over here on the podcast. Ren Kleiss is Fincher's guy. Yes. yes. He, he's, 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 he's taken now, over. Yeah, he's now at Pixar. He's doing Star Wars and everything. Yeah, right? yeah, he did Star Wars. But Ryan Strong's kind of moved on to directing, right? He directed some shorts for Pixar and stuff? He did direct some shorts. He also directed the uh, feature film Strange Magic. Which was the sort of like it was actually at Lucasfilm, and oh, it's okay. a ILM animated movie that uses like old '70s rock songs and a kind of like wow, it's a retelling of Midsummer Night's Dream. Is, is it Strange Magic, the ELO song? Yes, is it really? Yeah, yeah. What happened to that movie? It's Did a it come really, out? it's a really weird movie. Like Disney kind of like begrudgingly released it. Um, it was sort of with the Lucasfilm package when they bought Lucasfilm. They were like, "You're wow. gonna have to release this movie." But like Lucas did press for it. I was at the junket for it in New York. Wow, uh, it's on my movies anywhere, so you can watch it. Okay, general, yeah, yeah, I will have to watch that. Yeah, oh my God. so that's that's. I actually spoke to Gary Redstrom at that junket. So okay, it was you know another great, amazing technical guy who yeah, you know we love. We should get him on the show. We should get him on the show. Yeah, we got to track him down. Okay, well, we'll get him on the show. He's done both Ghost Protocol and the first movie. Another uh, two time uh, department head. Yeah, well, well, another another person for us to track down. I know. We got got a lot of work to do. do. (laughs) Also, just wanted to thank everyone for their reviews. We've gotten some really great reviews on, on iTunes. So please continue to give us reviews. That would be, we, we, we love it. It's so nice to have people, unless you didn't like the show, in which case, just uh, don't worry about it. Just go about your day and, and never, never, never write a review. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it to yourself. <laughs> um, so we've got two more weeks of Brad Birdie goodness. Please. Uh, Brad Birdie goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please come back. Um, obviously, like, subscribe, rate, review, tell people about it. Um, yeah, spread the word. Spread the word. Contact us on, on social media. Light the Fuse pod. Yes. We give away stuff every Monday. We'll put up information about this potential meetup in L.A. before the Vista screening. Yeah. Anything else you need to add? No. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. If you'd like to watch the original Mission Impossible television show, all seven seasons are currently available to stream on Amazon Prime. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.